am uh, the, a partner in our accounting methods practice here at Ide Bailey, and I'm here today with Sid Comaru, a manager in my group, and we're going to talk about some of the accounting method developments, some of the hot topics going on right now that we are working on, and. And um, the main things we're going to touch on today are the small taxpayer safe harbors that came in in connection with tax reform. We're going to talk very briefly about the bonus depreciation in Section 179 expensing rules that were also expanded um, in connection with tax reform. And then we're going to move on on and talk about the 163J, which is the new interest expense limitations, unfortunately has some implications from an accounting method perspective. So we're gonna talk and focusing mainly on those accounting method um, interactions. And then we'll move on to some revenue recognition. There's changes going on both on the gap side right now and uh, new tax rules. And then finally, we'll talk about the uh, recently issued final regulations under 263 Cap A regarding the negative, the treatment of negative negative additional costs. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sid. Thank you, Andrea. Um, yeah, as Andrea mentioned, I am Sid Komru. I have a manager with the accounting methods team. It's just Andrea and I actually that makes up the whole team. Uh, yeah, I've been with the firm for about two years. Um, it's been good so far. But yeah, let's talk about small taxpayers. Yeah, so we can just kind of uh, work through some of the updates to the small taxpayer safe harbors. These were all available in the past. The only thing is uh, a lot of them they actually raised the actual gross receipts limits. So prior prior to you know whenever prior to 2017, um, a lot of these had different limitations, and they were they were all kind of over the place. I know Unicap has some five dollar limitations, and uh, the cash method was a ten dollar million average gross receipts. Um, so now the four that that are most relevant for most folks is the cash method, the accounting for inventories, Unicap, and the accounting for long term contracts. And we'll go a little bit into detail for these. With the cash method expansion, like I said, it was $10 million average gross receipt before. Now it's $25 million. There, all of the four sm small taxpayer safe harbors are all at $25 million. Um, there's the accounting for inventories, which is basically the ability to treat inventories as not in dental material and supplies or uh, treat them the same as you do for book purposes. Um, Unicap. The good thing with that is that it's no longer limited to producers or resellers. Um, as long as you're under $25 million, uh, you can um, basically get rid of your Unicap Calc. And then the long-term contracts is the uh, exception from going to percentage of completion to um, one of the qualified methods, which is uh, CCM, complete a contract, um, cash or accrual. Um, so yeah, what, what is a small taxpayer? Um, so a small taxpayer is anyone that has gross receipts of less than $25 million in the prior three years. So if you're thinking about your 2018 return, for those of you extended, uh, you want to get your gross receipts for 2015 through 2017 and average those. And if that's under $25 million, uh, then you are a small taxpayer. The tricky thing is it's not necessarily your line one uh, after returns and allowances. It's not just your gross receipts, but there are some a few other factors that go into it. You have to think about some other income items, and if you are a partnership, uh, stuff that's flowing through your Schedule K, uh, those all get to take into account. It's a little bit trickier. Another thing is uh, the aggregation rules, and, and what the IRS is really trying to do here is to make sure there's not partners that have different businesses uh, that cumulatively add up for more than $25 million and they're identifying each of those businesses as small taxpayers. So if you have a partnership where a partner owns, you know, 80% of the partnership and that, that, that first uh, entity had about $12 million in gross receipts, but that same partner owns 100% of another partnership that has, you know, about $20 million in gross receipts, then, then you'll be over the line. The good thing is there's no limitation on entity or structure or business activities. So that, that's a big update for, for folks that were that couldn't get off Unicap in the past because uh, they were subject to it no matter what. This does apply for years after 1231-17. So for those folks that are fiscal year, you guys are going to be kind of a year late on that. But the small taxpayer definition is, is the same for exception from the interest limitations. So the IRS did give us guidance on how to implement these uh, small taxpayer changes, and they're all in uh, Rev. Proc 2018-40. And they, you, each of them is automatic change, which is good, because that means you don't need 
previous permission from the IRS. There's no filing fee for it. Um, it's just a simple 3115 um, and all the changes. The three changes that you can make together on one form are the cash method, the unit cap, uh, and the inventory exception. The uh, long-term contract change is done on a cutoff method, so that one does need to be filed separately, but they're still all automatic, um, so you should definitely take advantage of them if you can. The good thing is they are all shortened 3115s, um, so the IRS gave us uh, some leeway there and we don't have to go through the whole form. And also you're, you're going to receive audit protection for prior improper methods. So if you know you had some, so you do re receive audit protection for a prior improper method. Let's just say you had a unit cap method uh, that maybe you were just using a stagnant ratio and um, you know that was maybe an exposure in the past. If you if you file this, uh, as long as you are applying unit cap of some sort, if you file this change, um, it does give you audit protection for any prior improper methods. Um, like I mentioned, a long-term contract is implemented on a cutoff basis. So what that really means is any contracts that you had prior to the change will continue to run on uh, percentage completion, and then the second, uh, and then any, any contracts that start after you made the change uh, will be on whatever method you choose. So most likely CCM, but if you want to go to accrual to cash, that's an option as well. Um, and you still get the 41A adjustments and spreads. Um, the good. Also, there's a five-year limitation. Usually when you file these 31 15, so if you file like an accrual to cash or a cash to accrual in the past, an overall method, you'd have to wait five years and then file, and that's the only way you can change that method. Uh, but they do waive this for the small taxpayer changes. So if for whatever reason you made a, a, a cash to an accrual um, change you know, two years ago, you can actually still implement the small taxpayer change going to cash this year. Um, and uh, another thing is if you had a 41A adjustment in the past for the same method, let's just sit, use that same example from going to cash to accrual and that 41A adjustment was being spread. It was an unfavorable adjustment is being spread over four years. And if this is year three, you, you have the ability to combine that adjustment if you'd like, or you can, um, or if you want, you can just spread it over, continue to, to just take it on the same year. And this, uh, so the ability to use cash method, it's, it's not fair for all taxpayers. So it's not a definite, um, you want to really look at your AR balances. And if those are really, uh, outweighing your AP balances, then it's, then it's probably, um, a good bet that you're going to be having a, a 41A adjustment that's favorable. Um, some of those can be challenging just depending on your accounts and what kind of things you have in your balance sheet. Um, and what's really going to be in the 41A adjustment is anything on the balance sheet that impacts income statements and differs between the, based on the receipt or payment of cash. And then um, on slide 12 here, on the, on the exception from Unicap. Um, so this exception applies for both producers and resellers. Um, can we go another slide down here? Thank you. Um, so this ex exception applies for both producers and resellers. Um, so that means if you are um, either or, you should be filing this change um, and you get audit protection for prior and prior methods, like I mentioned. So this is a give me. I mean, uh, unless you want to save the deduction for a future year, it, it's probably uh, it's probably beneficial to, to file this change right now. And then the long-term contract change, um, this one only covers, so it, this can be, only be implemented if you're on the PCM method. And then if you're going to an exempt method, which is a CCM cash or, or accrual. Um, unfortunately, if you're on a different method, let's just say if you're on a accrual method and you're trying to go to complete a contract, that's, un uh, that's a non-automatic change. Um, so that unfortunately you would be, unless you're on PCM, you're kind of stuck there, but um, it's still very beneficial to go on CCM, um, which basically means that all the revenue is going to be recognized once the contract is completed. So you'd be able to defer the revenue. Uh, the inventory exception is probably the area of most uncertainty uh, related to these small taxpayers. Um, so what this one is saying is you can treat the inventory as non-incidental to materials and supplies, uh, which means will be deductible when it's used. Um, 
or you have the ability to treat them in accordance with your books or records. If you have a financial statement or if you're with your accounting policies, if you don't have a financial statement. So that kind of gives you some wiggle room there. So for folks that, you know, really want to expense their entire inventory. Um, and if you have an accounting policy that, that does the same thing for book, then, then you might be able to implement the same change. Um, that way you get a big benefit there. We are going to get some more guidance on um, the scope and issues to be uh, addressed. Uh, but if you haven't filed these in 2018, if you've already filed your 2018 return, it's okay. You can take advantage of these small taxpayer changes uh, up to 2020. So you can do it next year or the year after. Um, so the IRS has given some leeway there for folks that want to actually, um, yeah, I guess plan it for, for the future deduction. So from that, we'll go to our first polling question. Have you taken advantage of any of the small tax fair accounting method changes? Yes, no, if you plan to in the future. Okay, I think uh, Andrew will take it on now and talk to you a little bit about the bonus. Yes, thank you, Sid. So as I'm sure most people are aware, um, as this was a very, um, popular component of tax reform was the expansion of the immediate expensing provisions. They expanded bonus depreciation to 100% for qualifying property acquired and placed in service after September 27 of 2017. And that will stay that way through 2022. And then we'll start phasing that percentage back down. Um, so far, um, the, the guidance we've received from the IRS on these provisions are proposed regulations that we got last August. There were a number of comments provided to the IRS um, <clears throat> regarding these proposed regulations. In many ways, the proposed regulations were consistent with the guidance that the IRS had issued with prior iterations of bonus depreciation. However, there are some significant differences that we'll talk about in a minute, and commentators had a lot of thoughts about those changes. We are hoping to get these final regulations soon. Um, um, the last, the IRS has indicated they're shooting for late summer or early fall, which is unfortunately may not be in advance or significantly in advance of the extended return deadlines, but hopefully will give us some certainty as we start transitioning into 2019 planning. Generally speaking, there's four requirements for property to be eligible for bonus. It has to be qualified property. It must be either new property or meet the requirements for used property. That was probably one of the nicest expansions in this round of bonus depreciation is now certain used property can qualify, whereas in the past it all had to be new original use property in order to be eligible for bonus depreciation. And then there are placed in service and acquisition date requirements that must be satisfied that now we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. The other thing that was changed as part of tax reform, they modified the definitions and recovery periods for some improvements. So building improvement assets, historically there had been four categories, qualified improvement property, which was 39 year property, but eligible for bonus depreciation. And then we had leasehold improvement, retail and restaurant property that was 15 year depreciable property with also bonus eligible. The intention of tax reform was to collapse all four of those categories into a single category, qualified improvement property, and provide a 15-year recovery period for that, that category of property and make it 100% bonus eligible. However, there was an error in the statutory drafting and that provision was never included in the code. Therefore, we don't have, there's no such thing as qualified leasehold, retail, or restaurant property after the beginning of 2018. Everything is qualified improvement property, and qualified improvement property is 39 year property and is not eligible for bonus depreciation until we see a technical correction from the IRS, excuse me, from Congress on this issue. Um, our people in DC are telling us that. They think this technical correction may come through. However, it may not be until much later in 2019. So again, may not be in time for us to file our 2018 returns and might be something that we'll need to adjust um, after filing the returns. And as I mentioned before, used property was a nice expansion in this round of bonus debris. depreciation. And there's three requirements in order for used property to be eligible for bonus. First, the proper 
property cannot previously be used by the taxpayer or related party. The property has to be acquired by purchase and can't be acquired from a related party. So in other words, we can't be transferring this from one party to another. We can't look at inheriting this property from someone else. It needs to be purchased. It needs to be purchased for value and we have to pay cost. Our basis in the property has to be tied to how much we're paying for it and not how much we're exchanging something else in order to receive the property. Those are the three main requirements. And the first, the first requirement there is actually the one where we are getting the most questions. What does it mean for property to be previously used by the taxpayer? And the definition of previously used is that the taxpayer had a prior depreciable interest in the property. So in a lease setting where the taxpayer was truly leasing it, is considered a true lease for tax purposes, generally in that situation, the lessee does not have a depreciable interest in the property, the lessor retains that interest. And so if the lessee purchases the property from the lessor at the end of the lease, that would be eligible for bonus depreciation because they did not previously have a depreciable interest in that property. Some of the questions that have come up that commentators have requested further guidance on in the final regulations is how far do I really need to look back to see if I had a prior depreciable interest in this property? In some industries, property can change hands frequently, pieces of equipment, computers even, any of those tangible property assets change hands frequently and how do I know for sure that I didn't use this specific computer or that specific tractor or that specific truck in the past? So they've asked for some guidance on how far back do I need to go through my depreciation records to see if I had an interest in this. And what happens if I, so, if I sold something and then the person who bought it from me substantially rebuilt it? They took out all of the major components and put in all new, better stuff. Did I really previously have a depreciable interest in that asset? Am I really buying back the same thing? Those are some of the questions that have been raised. And as I said, we're hopeful that we'll see some answers there, but we don't know for sure. One of the other areas of confusion is the acquisition date requirements. So this could be fairly straightforward when you're talking about something you might be buying from Walmart or Home Depot or something like that. You acquire it when you walk in the store, you put it in your cart, you pay for it, and you walk out. It gets far more complicated when you start talking about assets that are acquired under a contract. So you sign a binding contract to buy something in the future. You're not going to, the property won't change hands, you won't make, pay any money money until the future, but you have a binding right to acquire that property in the future. There are also some questions around property that you're self-constructing. What if you're building a piece of equipment for use in your business? What if you are performing the own, you're performing the improvements on your own buildings? When is that considered acquired? And what happens if you're paying a third party to do that? You, you paid a third party to build this building for you. You paid a third party to build this piece of equipment for you. How do we just determine when that is acquired? And for property that's acquired by purchase, it is based on the date that the binding contract is entered. So here's a quick example of a situation in, two, in, in July, the taxpayer entered a contract with the dealership to buy a vehicle in October. They didn't, no, no money changed hands, the vehicle didn't change hands until October. However, because that binding contract was in place in July, the property was was considered acquired prior to September 27 of 2017 and therefore is not eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. And then the next two, um, the constructed by the taxpayer rules, this is also consistent with the way that the prior regulations ha handled this situation. And in that scenario, a taxpayer is considered to acquire the property as as they incur the costs. So once you've incurred 25% of the costs of building the, the asset, or the building or whatever it is, you are considered to have acquired that property. So in our example here, they started building a machine in June and they were more than 25% done by September. So again, we're considered to have acquired that property prior to September because we have paid a significant portion of the costs of building that property. Under per prior instances of the bonus depreciation guidance, the, the property constructed by a third party received the same treatment as property constructed by the taxpayer. So again, it would be tied to how many of the costs have I incurred in constructing or how many of the costs have I incurred paying the third party to, to purchase this, that, or excuse me, to construct this, that defines when it is considered acquired. They did, however, change this rule in this round of proposed regulations and are now treating this under the binding contract standard, meaning that we're considered to have acquired this property on the date we signed the contract with the third party, regardless of when the construction begins and regardless of how far along they are at any particular date, we're considered to have acquired that 
<clears throat> earlier on, excuse me, in the process, which is an unfortunate result for many taxpayers, and there have been a lot of comments. I don't know if this rule is going to change, but under the proposed regulations, unfortunately, in that scenario where you've hired a contractor, you're considered to have acquired everything that that contractor builds for you on the date you sign the contract with that contractor. The section 179 deduction was also expanded. The overall deduction was increased to a million and the phase out thresholds were increased to two and a half million and they're also adjusted for inflation going forward. They index the sport utility vehicle limitations as well. The, the nicest thing probably about the 179 though are the additional qualifying property categories. They expanded the definition of qualifying real property to include qualified improvement property, roofs, HVAC, fire protection, security, and assets like that. And the nice thing here is that some of these assets are not ever going to be eligible for bonus depreciation. Bonus, the only building assets eligible for bonus depreciation will be qualified improvement property when Congress gets around to fixing that. And things like roofs and certain HVAC components are generally not going to qualify as qualified improvement property because they're exterior to the building. Therefore, the only way to get an immediate deduction on that would be to take uh, the Section 179 deduction. And that takes us to our, our final slide here, which is, how do I decide? You know, for the next couple of years, bonus depreciation is 100%, 179 is 100%. How do I decide which way to go? Oh, and that depends. Like I said, there are going to be certain categories of property that are, qual that are eligible for 179 and not bonus. So obviously those we're going to want to take 179 for. However, we've got our dollar limits with 179. So if our overall property investment is too high, or if we're looking for to deduct more than a million, we're going to have to take some bonus depreciation. Some taxpayers are not eligible for 179. Certain estates and trusts are not eligible for that deduction. So if you have parties that are fall into the those categories, they're not going to be interested in a 179 deduction. And then some of the bonus depreciation limits that Sid's going to talk about in a minute that are tied to the new 163J interest expense rules. And with that, I think we're on to our next polling question. And that is, which of the immediate expensing provisions is most valuable to you? Bonus 179 or both? And I'm going to turn it back to Sid to talk about 163J. Thanks, Andrea. Yep, the uh, 163J, interest expense limitations. I'm sure everyone's kind of got to at least seen this, but here, here's kind of how the actual deduction works. So yet yeah, the actual calculation is just the, the sum of the business interest income, um, the floor plan, plan financing interest for the tax year, and the 30% of a business's adjustable taxable income. Now, the adjusted taxable income is computed without regard to business interest expense, business interest income, NOLs, and for years prior to January 1, 2022, depreciation, amortization, and depletion. And uh, one thing to note here is that Section 163J is not an accounting method. So the IRS has been clear in the past that the application of this is not an accounting method. And I guess the impact of that is, is really three things. Uh, one is that it's more than the deduction, more than deferral, and, and can really result in a permanent disallowance of interest expense. Also, you can't correct the erroneous method, uh, 163 calculation as an accounting method change. So you have to amend those prior year returns to correct them. And uh, the tax, the, the good thing is that you don't have to consistently apply the same methodology for 163J from year to year. So those three things make it so that it's not an accounting method. Uh, so yeah, th these are the four exceptions to, to uh, the interest expense limitations. So if you're a small taxpayer, like we talked about earlier, if you're under that $25 million mark, um, or if you elect real property trader business, you can also elect farming trade businesses or if you're a utility company. Um, so those are, those are the three exempt, uh, exempt exceptions. But there's, of course, a cost to that, other than if you're a small taxpayer. If you're a small taxpayer, there's, there's, really, no, um, there's really no cost of doing that. But if you are anything but a small taxpayer, uh, it's going to change your, it's going to limit your, uh, it's likely going to limit your depreciation, your bonus. So if you're a taxpayer that has floor, floor, floor plan financing, you're not allowed to claim bonus. Um, and if you're a taxpayer that's primarily engaged in utilities trade business, you're also not eligible for bonus. If you elect real estate or real property trade or for farming trade to be exempt from the 163J, you must use ADS 
for certain categories of assets and can't claim bonus. There's also an anti-abuse rule for self-rentals. So what this is really saying is if you kind of have a self-rental company, so if you, um, in, in this example here, let's say you own two different businesses, uh, one's an operating business and one's a real estate entity. If 80% of that fair market value of that real estate entity is um, for that same operating business, then you really can't elect real property trader business. Um, so I think, yeah, the IRS just wanted to make sure people weren't um, setting up these real estate entities so that um, the, to be, um, and then electing real property trader business to get out of limitation. But the, the one thing to keep in mind here is that if, since this is the case, you probably need to have enough income in your real estate entity to cover the interest expense limit. Um, otherwise you're, you're going to be limited. So, uh, and in implementing the ADS, there's a procedure guidance under RevProc 2019-08. One thing to note here is this is technically, if you go to ADS, it's technically a change in use of the asset rather than a change in method of accounting. So usually if you think about your depreciation changes, a lot of those are going to be accounting method change, but in this case, it's actually a change in use. What that means is that there's no 41A and anything prior to when you've actually implemented the change will continue to run on whatever method you had before. Uh, it's almost like a cutoff method change uh, in that sense. So the recovery period is based on your property's place and service. If you have residential rental property, um, place and service before 2018, that has a 40 year ADS recovery period. Um, but if it's place and service after 2018, then it has a 30 year recovery period. So there are some planning opportunities here. The one thing to note here is that 163J appear to apply at a trade or a business level rather than a taxpayer level. So if you have a taxpayer that have multiple trades or businesses, you may be able to apply this limit to, to some of the businesses and not others. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you have a bunch of different businesses, a bunch of different trades. Um, and the rules for this is determining whether a taxpayer has separate trade or business is based on accounting method principles. Um, if you have like the taxpayer that has maybe different books uh, or something of the sort, that's probably a good way to know. Or if you if you're utilizing different methods for it one's on accrual, one's to cash. That's kind of an easy way to tell if they're, they could be a, a different trade or business. But yeah, they're, you definitely want to take advantage of that. Um, and one thing to note here is that we haven't received the final regs for 163J. Um, so we're waiting for guidance. And I think that should be, the IRS claims it's going to come out late summer, early fall. So it could be up to August or uh, September. They're going to put out some proposed regs addressing a lot of the questions that people had. Um, so hopefully we'll hear back from that soon. Um, but you can still, I guess, yeah, for now, I think we were probably advising people to use the statute to um, make their best educated uh, assumptions and, and for 2018. Um, but you're not technically, I guess you don't have to follow the, um, the regs for the final regs for 2018, but those have will have to be implemented for 2019. We'll move on to Andrea to talk about a little bit about revenue recognition. Perfect. All right. So as I alluded to earlier, we have three developments going on right now in the revenue recognition area. First of all, ASC 606. This is a new GAAP accounting standard regarding the recognition of revenue from contracts with customers. This was effective for the 2018 year for public companies and is effective for private companies for the 2019 year. So a lot of our, our privately held clients are in the process of working through this analysis right now. At the same time, we had two provisions in tax reform that are going to interact and potentially overlap with our ASC 606 implementation. Section 451B, which relates to the um, how the all events test applies when you are recognizing revenue for tax purposes later than you are for book. And section 451C, which provides rules regarding advance payments, situations where you've collected cash in advance related to goods or services that will be provided in a future period. So the, I don't really wanna go into a lot of detail at ASC 606 because I am not an auditor and I never want to be an auditor. However, Generally speaking, the, the goal of ASC 606 was to provide a five-step principles-based recognition process that applied to taxpayers across all industries. So this is a very conceptually based standard. It's not a detailed rule-based standard, which they had 
used significantly in the past. It's intended just as a principles-based approach that you can apply to, to tax, excuse me, to businesses across a number of industries. So there's a five-step process, identifying the contracts, identifying the performance obligations within the contracts, determining transaction price, allocation, allocating that price among the performance obligations that we've identified, and then recognizing the revenue as the performance obligations are satisfied. My understanding is that most of the impacts of the, the, the most of the clients or businesses that are going to see an impact there are going to have what we call multi-deliverable arrangements, situations where you're selling a bundled good and service and you need to break that contract apart, pull apart the contract, pull apart the transaction price and recognize those differently going forward, whereas in the past, you may have treated that just as one overall performance obligation. From a tax perspective, we we have a, instead of a five part test, we have our two part all events test under 451 that is largely unchanged. All and that is all events have occurred to fix the right to receive the income and we can determine the amount of income with reasonable accuracy. Generally speaking, we're gonna be required to recognize income on the earliest of when it's earned, due or received, which we'll see later on an example of how that rule applies. And then there are some special rules for long-term contracts and installment sales and things like that that are also um, unchanged by the new revenue recognition standard for gap purposes. So now what? I mean, what, what do we do? Your auditors come to you and tell you, we need, you need to make a change to your financial accounting records under ASC 606 to recognize revenue differently than you have in the past. What does that do to you know, what does that do from a tax perspective? Well, our first question is going to be, can we follow that method for tax purposes? Are the new ASC 606 standards appropriate methods of accounting for tax purposes? And unfortunately, to date, we have received very limited guidance from the IRS on this issue. They have provided some procedural guidance that hints that certain components of the, of the five-factor test we talked about earlier, specifically assigning assigning the contract price to the performance obligations and is something that can be applied consistently for book and tax purposes. But a lot of things such as determining transaction price, things like that, we don't know how the tax rules really align with the new five-step process. So the first, the first step, unfortunately, on this slide is going to be a very difficult process right now since we don't actually know how to answer that question. Is this permissible? Good question. If it is permissible, then potentially we may need to file a Form 3115 or an accounting method change for tax purposes to move our tax method to be consistent with our new book method. However, if it's not an appropriate method for tax purposes, then we would be staying on our current tax method meaning that we'll have a new Schedule M adjustment that we need to track every year. But either way, regardless of whether we follow or not, we're going to have something we need to do going forward. There's going to have to be a change to our tax process. Either it's a 3115 or a new Schedule M adjustment. It is, unfortunately, we can't not have a tax impact when we have an ASC 606 change. Section 451B, as I alluded to earlier, was enacted as part of tax reform for tax years beginning after December 31, 17. This provision applies only to taxpayers that have an, a, an audited financial statement. So even a reviewed or a compiled financial statement. As the statute is written right now, um, we're hopeful that those people will not be subject to these rules. The IRS is working on regulations um, under 451B that are now at um, the Office of Management and Budget, Budget for review. We're hoping to see those in the next month to six weeks, maybe. Hopefully by August sometime, we'll have those regulations and we're hoping that the IRS is going to clear, confirm for us that we don't have an audited financial statement. We don't need to worry about 451B. What 451B does is it adds a third prong to the all events test we talked about earlier. So under our, our all events test, we recognize income when we have a fixed right to receive it and we can determine the amount with reasonable accuracy. And then 451B throws in a third requirement that is we cannot recognize revenue for tax purposes later than we are for book purposes, even if we haven't otherwise satisfied the all events test. So even though under prior law, we were in a situation where we didn't have to recognize the income under our all events test, 451B is designed to force us to recognize that revenue to the extent that we're picking it up in our, 
or audited financial statements. There are two very important ex exceptions here that we're also hoping that the IRS gives us some guidance on. First of all, 451B does not apply to what they call a special method of accounting. We have no idea how they're intending to define special method of accounting. It may include things like long-term contracts, installment sales. We don't know. We do, and if we can argue that our client's method of accounting is a special method of accounting, we can avoid applying 451B. So that's going to be important for taxpayers in some industries. And then the other exception that we don't necessarily have a lot of understanding around is that this doesn't apply where we have not had a realization event for tax purposes. So this isn't going to force us to mark to market securities that we're marking to market for book purposes because we haven't sold them. We need to have the sale, the realization event, before we have to realize that for tax purposes. So it isn't going to force us to use a mark to market method just because that's what we are doing for book purposes. And we have a quick example in here. Um, so in this situation, the taxpayer has a contract that they entered in year one to provide installation services. They start work in year one, finish in year two. Under the terms of the contract, they're paid 50,000 in year one, 50,000 in year two, and we'll assume that the taxpayer has an audited financial statement and that they're gonna recognize $60,000 in income in year one and $40,000 in income in year two. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens here? Under the old rules, just our basic all events test, we recognize income on the earliest of when it's earned, due, or received. Well, in year one, we've received $50,000, and that's the amount that's due, so that's the amount that we have to pick up for tax purposes. We aren't considered to have earned this until the full contract is complete, so our income recognition in year one is tied to how much cash we collected of $50,000. We pick up the rest in year two. Financial accounting purposes, again, we've got 60,000 in year one. We'll assume that they're doing that because the auditors have determined that the contract is roughly 60% complete. So they're gonna have them pick up 60% of the, of the revenue in year one and 40% in year two. 451B, unfortunately, is gonna come in here and tell us that even though we've only satisfied the all events test for 50,000 of, of the revenue, because we're picking up more of that in our audited financial statements, we have to follow our audited financial statements, even though our <clears throat> general all events test has not yet been satisfied. So this is a taxpayer that's looking at a potentially unfavorable accounting method change arising as a result of the 451B rules. And as I alluded to before, there's a few key open questions under 451B that we're really hoping <laughs> that the IRS IRS addresses for us soon because this is um, creating a bit of a challenge for us. You know, what are the special methods of accounting that are exempt? How do we know what is the difference between realization and recognition? If, you know, do we have a realization event in the prior slide where that $60,000, we didn't get that last $10,000, could we potentially argue that we haven't had a realization event for that last $10,000, so maybe we don't have to follow book? It's not clear. Unfortunately, that last example did come directly out of the JCT Blue Book, um, the, ex the explan explanation of the tax reform legislation. So maybe, maybe not. Maybe that exception helps us. Maybe it doesn't. And then we want, also would like to confirm that it is a full, that it, taxpayers with something less than a full gap audit are exempt from 451B because that will significantly reduce the burden for those taxpayers. Our third component here is 451C. As I said earlier, this applies to advance payments. These are amounts that we're gonna to receive to goods and services to be provided in the future. Um, historically, this has been the most, one of the most significant areas of book tax nonconformity for accrual basis taxpayers. We, under you know, a true accrual basis gap accounting, we're always tied to when it's earned. But for tax purposes, we have that third prong, the received prong. Once we've received cash, we have to recognize revenue for tax purposes, even if we haven't earned it. Under prior law, there was a one-year deferral that was provided under RefProc 2004-34 for goods or services where the cash was received in one year and um, was not earned until a subsequent year. 2004-34, however, only gave us a one-year deferral. So that meant that everything we collected in 2018 needed to be recognized by the end of 2000. 19, even if we hadn't completed the contract by the end of 2019, and even if we were continuing to defer that revenue for book purposes. There's two potential exceptions um, arising, the differences between for the language 
Act of 451C and Ref Proc 2434 that could leave some taxpayers currently using 2434 could be in a worse position under 451C. First of all, 451C explicitly only states it applies to goods and services. 2434 historically provided or applied to a wider range of income. It was goods and services, but it also included certain software licenses and subscription income. It included gift cards, things like that that don't appear to be included strictly under the statutory language of 451C. And also 451C has a requirement that it only applies to taxpayers with an audited financial statement. Same definition as we had in 451B. So without some guidance from the IRS, it would appear that if we're subject to 451B, or if we can avoid 451B, we're also not eligible for 451C, so we lose the potential benefit here. This is a quick example on how 451C could apply. So we have a taxpayer with a four-year software license for $100,000. They're going to pick up $25,000 a year in their audited financial statements. Under 2434, we can follow book in the year that the income is collected. So we'd pick up $25,000 in year one, same as we're doing for book, and then we'll pick up the rest in year two, the other $75,000 in year two. So what happens under 451C? Well, the first issue is, as I said, 451C requires an audited financial statement. So if this taxpayer doesn't have an audit, it's possible that they are no longer eligible for that one year deferral, meaning that they have $100,000 of income in year one. Again, software license revenue is not explicitly covered by 451C. It's covered by RevProc 2434, but not explicitly by the statutory language in 451C. And we also may have a situation where we have an accounting method change. Even though we're getting to the same answer, moving from a 2434 analysis to 451C potentially generates um, an accounting method change obligation for us that we need to consider with our 2018 or 2019 returns, depending on um, when we finally, we get some guidance from the IRS. These regulations are also at OMB for review, and we're expecting that these will be issued either with the 451B regs or shortly after that. So we're hoping in that, yeah, four to six week time frame, we're gonna start seeing some um, guidance from the IRS on this. And then there are some other additional potential impacts of 451C that we need to be aware of. If we have clients that have significant advance payments. The IRS issued a notice last year that they intend to withdraw Treasury Regulation 451-5. This used to provide a two-year deferral method for certain sales of goods. Um, it didn't apply to services, only applied to goods, but the IRS believes that 451C supersedes that, and so that regulation is likely to be withdrawn. There are some other deferral methods that certain taxpayers have used. There's a 451-4 method um, for trading stamps that a lot, of a lot of taxpayers use for reward programs. We don't know if 451C is going to impact the validity of those, those reward programs going forward. There were also some favorable case law, some favorable court decisions that allowed an extended period beyond one year. We're not clear if the precedent in those cases are going to retain validity going forward. And then there's there are other unique scenarios where the IRS has provided some exceptions. For example, the service warranty method under Ref Proc 9730. Those are things that we don't know for sure if those are going to be valid methods moving forward or if those everyone is going to get swept up into 451C. So now what? <laughs> if you probably have come to the conclusion that I told you a lot of things and gave you no answers, which is unfortunately where we're sitting right now with the revenue recognition standards. And we are expecting guidance from the IRS, as I said, hopefully in the short term. But in the meantime, I think the things that are important from a tax perspective here is make sure you're involved in the ASC 606 implementation. Make sure you're understanding, are they making changes to our financial statements? If so, what are those? Is that going to have an impact or how will that impact my tax reporting because it likely will. Do I have any favorable book tax differences? These are things that are potentially going to get caught up in 451B and are going to be accelerated going forward. So looking through my Schedule M adjustments, are there items of income that I'm deferring for tax purposes longer than I am for book purposes? And then do I have advanced payments? Do, do I have situations where I'm collecting cash in advance? I'm 
they're often shown as deferred revenue, under an income, liabilities on the balance sheet. If I have significant balances there, I need to pay attention to the new 451c rules because my ability to defer that may change when we get the final rules under 451c. So I think this is the, the last subject we're going to cover. Uh, hopefully you guys found some of this information useful and if you guys have any questions, um, I'll certainly reach out to Andrea and I. Uh, I think the, the slides that we sent out have our information on it. But yeah, the negative additional unit cap cost. Um, so this has kind of been around for a while, but the final regs were finally issued in November of 2018. And it's going to be effective for tax years beginning uh, on or after that date. And then it's primarily going to impact taxpayer using the simplified production method. Um, and some of the key concepts here for maybe those that don't work with Unicap every day is um, so Section 471 cost is usually costs that are capitalized into inventory for book purposes. Um, usually it's direct materials, labor, but sometimes you'll get some overhead and some uh, other things in there. Uh, Section 263A cost, it's usually costs that aren't included in the 471 cost that are required to be capitalized under Section 263A. So that's how we usually get our Unicap costs. Now, when, the way to get a negative unit cap cost is if you're capitalizing something for book or financial statement purposes under 471, that you're not required to capitalize under 263A. So stuff like uh, sales, marketing, and, and freight out costs would usually be a deductible activity under 263A. Um, but if you are capitalizing those for book purposes, then it's almost going, going to run in through uh, as a negative adjustment for your tax cost uh, and your book tax differences uh, where your book expense, your tax expenses, um, let's say that the years that your book depreciation uh, flips and it's in excess of your tax depreciation, um, then those years uh, you're going to have a negative adjustment for that particular account. There are some safe harbors that you can utilize. One of them, which I think will probably apply to a lot of you, will be if you have a gross receipts over $50 million. I'm sorry, gross receipts under $50 million. So that's one of the safe harbors you can use. And then if you're a taxpayer using the simplified resale method, uh, you don't need to worry about uh, taking into account for the negative unit cap costs. And if you're a taxpayer using the new simplified production method, um, which I don't think most of you would be. So what they're really trying to do is aim for producers that are, um, yeah, that are any kind of method uh, any producer over $50 million, you, you probably want to take a closer look at this. Um, but this is kind of what the modified method looks like now. Um, it's still simplified and it's, I don't think it should be too difficult to try to figure this out, but they're really just breaking this down between pre-production and during production. And yeah, you're just adding those two ratios. So you're kind of doing a separate analysis. You're trying to figure out Hey, what, what, what are the unit cap costs of pre-production um, versus the pre-production 471 cost? And then any of that that's still in the inventory, that's what's going to be taken out. Um, and same with the, with the bottom one there. It's just the production and any resi residual pre-production unit cap cost. Um, that's going to be times your any production 471 cost remaining in the ending inventory. So RevProc 2018-56 is where they provide the automatic changes for these taxpayer, I mean, for these method changes. Um, and it does waive the five-year eligibility restriction for these three years. Like that's kind of similar to uh, the small taxpayer safe harbors um, that we talked about earlier. And um, yeah, the one good thing is that it does expand on existing Unicat methods. And uh, it does allow for the revocation of the higher election for those of you that are on it uh, as an automatic change. So usually you, you can't really get off HAR until, you know, unless you are um, filing a non-automatic change. Um, or I guess if you actually go over the, the absorption ratio limitations. But yeah, so that, that's a good thing. And yeah, if you're a, a producer over $50 million, you, you want to take a closer look at this. But otherwise, if you're under $50 million or you're a reseller that, that, that's already on simplified methods, maybe this doesn't apply to you. But we just wanted to put it out there to, to let people know that it's kind of out there. And uh, if it's something you need to look at, then maybe, uh, yeah, give us a call. And then I think with that, we'll move it over to Amy.
Well, the, the polling question, uh, does the treatment of inventory need to be the, the, the same between reviewed and audited financial statements and the tax treatment? If so, can a contractor recognize all material inventory as material expense on jobs and the financial statement and not have an inventory um, on the financial statement? That um, is actually one of the areas we're hoping to get some clarity from the IRS. It would appear that if it is a true audited financial statement or an applicable financial statement, we would likely be stuck following our book method and capitalizing the costs that are capitalized for book purposes. If we have some sort of a financial statement that is lower than an audited financial statement, whether it's reviewed or compiled or even just an internal financial statement, it's not clear the how the safe harbor is going to interact with that are there going to be certain requirements for how those are accounted for in financial statements in order to take advantage of the safe harbor or are, is it if we truly just have an accounting policy in our files that says i'm going to deduct this for tax purposes we don't need to worry about how the inventory is being accounted for. And i know you know as sid alluded to this is definitely the area where we have the most uncertainty in the small taxpayer space and is hopefully one of the more likely issues that will be addressed in whatever guidance the IRS does eventually issue on this, because I know there are a lot of taxpayers without audited financial statements that have been struggling with this. And I would say that, you know, among our client base, we have seen people take different positions on this, depending on their particular circumstances, which may very well be how this is handled going forward. And the timing on that guidance, um, I don't know. I'm, we're hoping it's soon. We're hoping it's within the next few months. But uh, the last I'd heard, the IRS had not um, gotten very far along in the drafting process. So I'm not sure what the timing on that is. So yeah, right now, I guess the, the biggest things we're waiting for in the method space right now is the revenue recognition that we'll hopefully see in the next, hopefully, you know, months to month and a half. Uh, the 163J and bonus regs, those final regulations are probably both late summer, early fall. Um, there, there will be additional proposed regulations under 163J addressing some of the issues that weren't addressed in the first round of proposed regs, specifically some of the self-charged interest and tiered partnerships, some of the more complex rules that weren't addressed in the original round will be proposed hopefully later this summer. Um, and then the small taxpayer guidance I think will be also significant for us when we get that from the IRS to hopefully be able to get a little more clarity on how these safe harbor should be applied going forward. I think that was, were there other questions? I didn't see, no. I don't see any. That was the only one. Okay. Well, yeah, as Sid mentioned, our contact information is here. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or uh, yeah, clarification on the presentation. Awesome. Thank you all so much for staying on with us. We apologize for the difficulty. We will get this cleaned up and um, get the recording um, all beautiful and get that sent out to everyone who participated so you can watch it again if you would like. Thank you to Andrea and Sid and everybody have a great day.